Welcome to Abuelas en Acción, a multicultural podcast for our common good. I'm Marie Dahlstrom, and I'm here with my guest co-host, Marsha Robinson, otra abuela, and our newest co-host, Itzia Mejia, joining the Comadres of Abuelas en Acción. Here on Abuelas, we, we have the honor of meeting around the virtual table to tell our stories, share our defining moments, our gratitude, our pain, and our hopes. Our warming climate, global conflicts, and the erosion of our civil rights all remind us of the importance of meeting whatever life brings us with an open heart, a balanced mind, and committed action. We can't change what is happening in the world, what happens in our lives, but we can change how we respond. And I I don't know about you, but that that that's very uh, comforting to me and um, it inspires me, empowers me. We are inspired by life stories of our guests here on Abuelas en Acción. And our guest today is no exception. Phyllis Anderson will share her journey as an immigrant to El Salvador and to share her perspective on life as a woman and a Salvadoran. We look forward to our conversation with Phyllis. Well, Marie, I loved what you said about an open heart, because I think when we can approach life with an open heart and curiosity, we can gain so much wisdom. And there is so much wisdom out there with wise women. And that's who I think of as Phyllis. I think she's this amazing, inspiring, wise woman. And I am so excited to have this conversation with her today. So just to let you know, I have known Phyllis for uh, probably over 20 years. And so I was so excited when she was coming back into the country for 10 days, two weeks, and I had a chance to visit with her again. And I thought, I really want to share the impact that she has had on my life personally by having her tell her story. And so Phyllis, we always really like to start out, Abuelas, with one um, question. And that is, can you describe a defining moment in your life? Well, probably it started when I was a child because I, um, my mother wanted me to be in 4-H club and I said, no, you have to do demonstrations. I don't want to do that. And then when I was in eighth grade, my best friend joined 4-H and I was like, oh, I want to do that. And so because of my um, participation in 4-H as a young person, I was able to go with the 4-H Federation to El Salvador as a Peace Corps volunteer at only age 19. So I was very, very, very young. And um, so that introduced me to world travel and to the Salvadoran culture and to the Salvadoran language and, of course, the country. And I fell in love with with the people there. And it just always stayed with me. Um, 20 some years later, I married my first love from El Salvador. We got married and have a daughter who is very proud to be Salvadoran and goes back and forth between El Salvador and, 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 uh, double majored in college in Latino studies and, um, and theater. So, um, we, I've just had that connection with El Salvador. So when, um, it came to retirement, I thought, well, how about if I go to a warm climate and retire? So I went to El Salvador. So that's why I now living in El Salvador. And as an immigrant in El Salvador, I realized even with my legal status, with my education, with my knowledge of the country, um, it is still difficult to be an immigrant. So I'm so um, amazed at how immigrants um, survive here in the United States and, and they do so well. They do more than survive. They contribute to the culture here. So I'm, um, I've become much more compassionate and understanding of what it means to be an immigrant. And um, so uh, hats off to you, especially at um, Itzia. Is that how you say your name? Yes. Uh -huh. It's beautiful. So um, that's, that's how I got um, to El Salvador. And since um, in my abuela years, I learn every day, and um, it's it's very it's very life giving to be in a situation where I can keep learning. 
Well, I want to back up a little bit so we can really put a nice frame around the Abuelas work that you've done. So when I first met you, you were we we didn't have even a language in our elementary schools. And we knew that we had to, if we wanted our children to be multicultural and multilingual, we needed to get in, in early. And you were our one person who came to teach Spanish and you were willing to give it to the parents as well. And I remember you'd bring in all these clothes and you'd go, Pone los pantalones on you know, to us. And you made learning Spanish so fun for those of us who don't speak Spanish. And um, but then, you know, when I started to just see what everything you were doing in the world, you know, teaching um, college. And one of the things that really changed my perspective on the world is when you shared your dissertation with us on the effects of war on women. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and why you chose that for your PhD. Um, well, I knew I wanted to do my research, first of all, in El Salvador. And of course, women and what women do, women hold up the world. Um I just wanted to see what the effects were because I was going through the dissertation right after, right during and after the civil war in El Salvador, which was between 1980 and 1992. So I thought, well, what would be the difference in the conscientization of women from pre-war to, to post-war and what, what were the effects of war? Um, so I learned a lot that, so women were empowered during the war, um, which they hadn't been before. They took on different responsibilities. They were able to leave the house and get trainings. And, and although they suffered so much trauma as war victims do, um, they lived in a refugee camp for um, 10 to 12 years, depending. And um, But during that time, they made the best of it. They um, learned how, and they learned new skills. They learned um, about gender equity that they'd never experienced before, and they took on leadership roles. And so when they were repatriated back to El Salvador after the Civil War in 1992, they took on major um, leadership roles in the community. And um, they, you know, were part of the water project and the building project and just, you know, had a woman's voice that um, traditionally you didn't hear in El Salvador. So I really admire these women. Not only did they have the responsibilities of raising the children and and doing all the uh, holding the family together, they took on leadership roles and and kept on learning and growing. So this is the village then that I live in now, where I met these women and um, heard their stories and um, just became. Uh, enamored with who they were as women, as people, and then, um, you know, got to know their, uh, the community, and uh, it, they've just accepted me and embraced me, which I feel really grateful for, because I realized that immigrants here are not usually embraced, and um, it's a, it's very much injustice, so I very much understand um, what the difference is. Well, and there was a lot of synchronicity in that too, I think, because when you went back, didn't you meet the daughters and people of, of the women that you had volunteered with and helped as a Peace Corps volunteer? Oh, um, not, uh, there was some correlation. Be, oh, because where I was as, as a Peace Corps volunteer was right up by the Honduranian border. And so the same area where I worked as a Peace Corps volunteer was where the uh, majority of people that uh, live in WCC Lapan now were originally from. So yes, I knew the area. I knew I knew I knew some of the people, common people that they knew. I have an embroidered map of El Salvador that that somebody embroidered for me. I couldn't remember who it was, and my neighbor across the street knew who it was. So we we went back to to meet that woman, and and you know, forty years later, it was it was wonderful. Yeah. Wow. Well, I just want to give our listeners a little bit more information on some of what I would call 
accolades, but they're not the societal and cultural accolades. I don't think that come from the outside. I've always thought of you as a woman who really made choices on your core values and moved from seeing a need and then responding to it. So I, a few of the things I know you did is you created software when computers were coming around. Because remember, we were born before computers. A lot of the younger generation, <laughs> I don't think, can imagine what life was even before smartphones. But we came before computers. You were one of the first people people that I know that created a software bilingual kids to teach um, Spanish uh, to bilingual and not just one accent, but it was Mexican and Spanish, uh, you know, Spain. And so you could learn whichever accent in Spanish that that you wanted. Um, you you were awarded. Was it volunteer of the year from Volvo? Remember that car you won? Oh, I didn't win the car, but I wanted some kind of Oh. recognition, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I want well, a different car to supermarket. <laughs> oh, well, it was it was a bigger than life story for me that that you were, you know, being recognized as a volunteer. Um, let's see, what else do I have? Oh, yeah. So one of the, again, one of the new big, one of the biggest effects you had on me, again, I don't know why we have these conversations in the car, we go for coffee or something, and you said... <laughs> Can you, you know, tell me what books mean to you? How important is our books to you? And I sat there and I have four children and my favorite memory is holding them on my lap and reading to them at night. And when you said that, I thought, oh my gosh, I can't imagine a childhood. I can't imagine being a parent without being able to read to my children. And that's when you were telling me that the women that are our age down there still had not had the opportunity to learn how to read so that they hadn't had that experience. And you set out on your own after you created Abuelas, which is an organization. Would you want to, why don't you explain? Hermanas. What, Hermanas. Hermanas. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Will you uh, tell our listeners what Hermanas is? Yes. Well, yes, it was a conversation in the car with you <laughs> that started it all. I came back from doing my field research and living a year in El Salvador. And I said, you know, I just need to keep this connection alive. I miss these. I miss these people. How do we keep the connection alive? And how do we how do we um, en engage other people in the, in the States, women, like minded women to um try to make the world a better place and you said well just invite your friends and so wow so you were the one that um said just invite your friends so i did and i had about 20 women show up my at my house and um and said you know these are the women that have gone through so much and it would be wonderful if we would join together as women in support of one another here and then support the women in in El Salvador, in this village and um so that's what we did so that was in February 2002 and we just had a meeting last Friday Friday so we're still going not as strong as we were because people are retired and and older and have commitments with their grandchildren and different things. The lives have, lives have changed a lot, but we made a huge impact. So we started with um, being in solidarity with the women. Several women went down to meet some of the women and stay for a week or two. And, and then from there, we saw that the big need was education in the village. So we started supporting the school and the educational program. We started a high school program. Um, young people from um, LC and St. George's, St. George's actually donated computers. We took a computer each to, to um, the village and set up the first computer lab. And then we were able, they were able to start the high school program. And then from there, we just kept supporting the teachers in the schools and building classrooms and whatever they needed. We tried to um, support and help them. And the last, for me, the last piece of the puzzle was to have a library. So the director of the school said, you know, we need a library. But it was so interesting, the cultural differences, because his idea of a library, because he didn't understand books and reading. He didn't have books to read to his children. He just thought, well, you know, it's more like an encyclopedia that if you need to know something before Google, you just go look it up. So there's just shelves on the uh, books on the shelf. But my idea of a library was interactive library where you would read to children, where children could um, 
read themselves, be read too, and um, learn uh, different educational activities that they didn't have access to. So, um, so Hermana Spokane raised money. It took us many, many years, but we finally did it and um, and built the library in in Weesey. And uh, so, it's just growing. There wasn't a culture of literacy at all, and um, and I had the experience that Marcia did is reading to my daughters and reading to to uh, and that bonded us the the idea of reading and these people not only didn't have books, they didn't have puzzles, educational games that would um, tweak your your curiosity and memory and um, strategy and so on. So that's what that's what our library is now. It's very interactive and, and very fun. So adults come also and they've never had that experience. So of uh, putting puzzles together, for example. So they come and we thought, oh, the the parents would come and bring their kids and interact with their kids. No, they just want to play too. <laughs> well, and tell us about the book that you're working on now. Oh yeah. So so the the problem is once you have a library, you need to maintain it and you, um, you need to open it, of course. And so we have some volunteer People in the community that um, open the library and maintain the library, we clean the library, open the library, service the library. But um, eventually we need to have some income and people to get paid some money at least. And um, so we decided that we would do a bilingual book with body parts, a board book for like zero to four year olds where, um, so we had, we took pictures of five-year-olds because little kids like to look at pictures of, of actual other children. So we took um, pictures of them with their putting their hands on their head, like tengo una cabeza para pensar, tengo las orejas para oír, tengo una nariz para oler. So we have them you know, smelling a flower and just different things. So it's all, all the body parts and what, it, what it's used for with these five-year-olds that are just absolutely darling. And um, so we have it bilingual. It's in both English and Spanish. And um, so it's almost, it's, so it's, uh, we're being edited, it's being edited now so we can hopefully get it published. And um, everybody says there's no money in publishing and so on and so forth, but we need to start somewhere to get um, some resources and some funds so that we can, so that the library can continue to grow and expand and, and um, be supported. Well, and I feel like, Everything you do really acknowledges the people that you're working with um, in both countries. And I think the children that are in those pictures, a part of that book, are going to be so feel very empowered by it. I'm sure anxious to see it, too. Thank you. Um, I just have one more real question, and that is, you know, you've kind of explained this whole thing from fourth and fifth grade up till now to retirement. And when we were talking the other day, you mentioned the importance of patience, you know, that everything led to something else and something else and something else. And I feel like with the mental health crisis that we are here in, in North America, patience is not one of the things that is highlighted to get through when things are hard. And I was hoping that you could just share what your feelings are about patience in life and how it relates to being able to accomplish things that to me are amazing. Uh, well, we're pretty much a, a, a culture that likes um, things to happen right now. And I'm definitely a product of the U S culture and I want things to happen now. So I had to learn a lot of patience in El Salvador and um, you know, the culture there, they live more at the moment and we live in the future. We want, you know, things to happen now so that we can go on and on and on. So um, I personally have had to learn a lot of patience. Um, it took us, well, just for example, a long time to raise money for the library and um, and then to get the library built and so on and so forth. And, and I just grew to realize that all of that was a growth process because as we were waiting and things were happening, we were educating ourselves, we were educating each other, we were getting um, people ready to even accept uh, the gift of the library in this case, uh, for example, because uh, like in the 60s, when I was there in the Peace Corps, the U.S. government through aid would just go and build a clinic and say, okay, here's the clinic. 
Well, they did a clinic in my little village where I lived and people were afraid to go there. It wasn't a part of them. They didn't, they didn't, you know, they were, they were afraid to go. It was all enclosed and everything. And they thought, wow, this is like, are we going to be able to get out if we go in inside that enclosure? So, uh, so we're, so I've just learned that by, um, you just working together from the ground up, we can work together and, and learn from one another and be patient because every time, um, we might have a little obstacle or get a little frustrated. It's like, oh yeah, but look at what has happened already and and look at where we're going and look at how, you know how much we've learned and how much we've grown and got to know one another and build a community. And so um yeah, like now my my community is the people that volunteer and work in the library. So we've we've just grown and grown together and are, are really good friends and associates. It's, it's, it's fun. So um, yeah, personally, that was one thing that I really had to do was patience. And um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to um, have a, a, a abuelas read to abuelas reading time when we would um, read to some of the abuelas and abuelos in the village. We would read read to them um, and a lot of them like to read about their, their history and and then uh, talking about mental health we were like going oh my goodness that's something that we're not expertise and we can't be um, bringing up memories that we're not able to deal with and so that's that's a project for down the road hopefully we we'll get some experts like you Marie who are mental health experts that um could can deal with the trauma and help some of the older generation um, release some of the trauma that they've experienced through the war. That would be beautiful. And I know Marie and Itzi, I both have questions for you all. So Itzi, do you want to go ahead and go next? Thank you, Phyllis. Yeah, sure. thank you. Um, I My question, as a Mexican immigrant myself, um, I feel like we never really hear the real narrative about American immigrants. Um, and so my question would be, please tell us about your experience being an American immigrant to El Salvador and what life lessons you've learned from your Salvadorian community members. And what, sorry, what was the last part? Um, what uh, lessons have you learned from your um, Salvadorian wow. community members? Yeah, uh, many. Um, yeah, so at first, it's first as you have the honeymoon period, and um, I lived actually with a family of ten people, in a in a pretty little house, <laughs> a pretty small house, which just had an outdoor latrine and whatever. So I did have that experience of the community of a family of a large family all living together, which was wonderful. So there was um, people to share chores with, and we played games, and and you know just the ups and downs. So it was multi generational. It, it was really fun. So that was a, a wonderful bonding experience I had with, with that family. Um, and um, the issue, uh, so because the culture is so much more laid back, um, some things that drove me crazy if we were to have a meeting or something, people would all, all come late. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's a waste of money because in the U.S. culture is like time is money. And, you know, so like I said, I'm a project product of this culture. And it was like, drive me crazy. But, um, you know, I just had to learn to go with the flow. And I was like, OK, if we're having an event, I'll go an hour and a half late and then I'll be right on time. <laughs> uh, so, uh so I, I learned that and, and you can respect it because they don't run by the clock. It's it's they just like, you know, whatever you have to do your chores or whatever first and then you go and play, so to speak. Um, So so that is fun. And everybody is so helpful, giving, outgoing the the you don't you're not locked up in your houses and separated from your neighbors like we are here in the States. I appreciate that so much. And um, my kitchen window faces the street, one of the busiest streets in the community. And so we can just talk back and forth out the window. And then <laughs> sometimes they come in and sometimes I go out. And so it's it's, it's just that community oriented um, kind of atmosphere that you don't have to work at. It's just natural. 
So it's it's so much nicer than what we have than what we have here in the states. For me, I definitely appreciate that. Um, you know, the government issue, the government things. You know, there's always things with immigration that you have to go through, and they're they're a pain. But again, I am so blessed because I know Spanish. I can at least navigate through the system, and um, so it's just not like it is for for y'all that come here to the states people are not are not friendly they're not helpful they're it's very very difficult so i realize that so um it's just kind of more of a pain for me <laughs> um i don't know anything else <laughs> well and and let's continue phyllis talking about that um uh and um I'm yeah, the issue of mental health and trauma and the, you know, trauma that never goes away. It doesn't matter how many years have passed. That's been um, a concern of many of us. Uh, um, trauma that so many families are experiencing, the trauma of coming to the United States, the trauma of uh, the, the journey, the trauma of um, uh, you know, becoming uh, uh, it just life in the U.S. Um, civil war in countries like El Salvador, and and now what we're seeing um, uh, between um, uh, Gaza Strip and um, and uh, Israel, the conflict, uh, it's a lose lose um, mm -hmm. for everyone and. Um, we see the impact so harshly on women and children, but all are impacted by the trauma and the, the grief and loss. Let's talk a little bit about your politics and life in El Salvador right now. Your president, Nayib Bukele, is viewed throughout Latin America. My president. <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, I, uh, I, I'm getting a sense um, uh, based on, I saw that he was interviewed by Tucker Carlson and uh, Fox News here in the U.S. I was kind of getting a picture of um, his, um, uh, where he falls on the political spectrum. Um, uh, he's viewed throughout Latin America as a model for iron-fisted approach to reducing violence, uh, gang violence in, in El Salvador. But countries like where my family's from, El, uh, from Ecuador, you know, there is a lot of interest in uh, him and, and candidates who have that, you know, uh, uh, very iron-fisted approach. Um, how has life changed in particular for Salvadoran women and children under his state of emergency, bringing the military into communities throughout the country. What have you seen? What have you um, experienced? Mm, I'm not supposed to comment on that because I don't, I don't have um, my residency yet. And so I am not to um, be involved in politics at all. Um, just generally speaking, the people in the country see no uh, benefits from his policies and the people in the city do. So he has more support from the United States and from the city than, than from the country, generally speaking. So um, for women and children in general, um, has uh, violence improved at all in the country or that remains the same? Because what we have heard uh, in the U.S. is so much about the impact of gangs in, um, for women and children. Um, but has any of that changed? Um, well, first of all, the first form of violence is poverty. And so the, so the people, the women and children, um, because so many men have immigrated to the United States, um, were left a lot of women and children are left behind. Um, they are poor, and poverty is violence. 
So um, that's what the people in the countryside that I'm dealing with is they don't deal with gangs. They have dealt with some gangs more in the past. Um, and um, but it's it's very controversial. And I don't understand um, the complexity of some of what's happening in some of the rural areas. Um, it's not positive for the people in in my in my village where I live. So, but you know, we think about violence as being guns and drugs and stuff, but poverty is poverty is violence, and that's why people are leaving. They're leaving in droves because it's just like it, just like the animals. Why don't we have an immigration policy that's more like um, the animals? They the animals go they migrate where there's food. If there's no food, they have to move, right? They go from place to place wherever they have grass or grazing or whatever to 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 eat. And so that's why people are immigrating because they don't have food. It's um and um so yeah, but let's talk about that for a moment. I personally have noticed a shift. It, um, amongst people who um, are um, progressive, consider themselves progressive and open-minded about the world and in the past, immigration. And I've seen that change in that um, uh, people uh, around the country, I know, um, uh, large cities uh, like New York and Chicago, um, certainly here on the border where I live in uh, San Antonio, we have a history of a, a lot of um, migration. And uh, San Antonio is a, um, despite being in a, a very conservative state, San Antonio is an uh, open uh and welcome, uh, welcoming city to immigrants, as are other cities on the border. But um, there's been a lot of uh, publicity. I know um, homelessness is a big issue in cities um, across the country. And now there's been a huge influx of migrants. And so people who in the past have been very supportive are shifting. Uh, on the news, you hear uh, different um, elected officials and politicians for sure. Um, Mayor um, Eric Adams uh, went actually to Latin America to tell uh, um, migrants to not take the journey. Um, and the other part of that is uh, Americans have become accustomed, and I would say we've become numb in many ways to videos of thousands of migrant families making that long trip with heart-wrenching stories of pain and loss. So could you share some insights on how this whole immigration to the U.S. has impacted families? You mentioned poverty. Uh, I would add, too, that climate you know, change. Global warming has impacted people's ability to be able to raise crops and to, you know, um, make, you know, uh, a, a, a living for families. Um, what are some of the reasons that you see that um, migrants leave um, and the impact on families left behind? Well, it's a terrible brain, brain drain in the community where I live. All the young people, the most prepared people are all coming here to the States because there's no opportunity. So besides living in poverty, there's no opportunity. And um, if you don't have opportunity and hope, what do you have? So people will take the risk to borrow money to hire a coyote to be able to come safely here. And they're, and now it's like $15,000 they're paying to hire a coyote to come here. And so then once they're here, even though it's they're miserable, they feel like they have to work, they have to do whatever just to pay off the loan. And then they don't have the opportunity to go back and forth to see their loved ones, to see their families. And 
And um, so not only is it impacting the communities that they're leaving, like like we're losing so many people who, and we see it's very, very sad for me. Um, but then I, 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 I see also on the news then that the schools are being overrun here in the States. There just are no classrooms. There's no, there's no place to put um, the vast number, vast, vast number of immigrant children. So I am personally worried about how the, what's going to happen. Um, because as you were saying, the progressives are like, like, let's welcome the immigrants. Yes, let's welcome them. But, but now it's like, okay, but we can't service them. Um, so or at least the children in the schools. And so what do we do to keep people together in their own community so that they still have their their lovely culture and their family units um that immigration breaks up oftentimes sometimes they come as whole families but they still are in a different environment that's very difficult um so you know if there was more economic opportunities and hope like in el salvador for example in 2001 they changed from the cologne to the u.s dollar and they changed over very rapidly. So in so it used to be like nine colognes to a dollar. So you would pay like in colognes to then all of a sudden they jumped to dollars. And so people, the saying is that people are paid in colognes and they um, have to pay for services in dollars. So they are just going backwards economically. So if they had some kind of, if they, even the educated people, like I have a, a friend who has worked for the government, actually, um, for many years, now about six years. She has a, a degree in economics. She has very, she has so much responsibility. I can't believe it. And she gets paid like six, $700 a month, six, $700 a month on the U.S. dollar economy. How do, you know, that's, it's just very disheartening. There's no hope for her to ever be able to <clears throat> have a house and the travel back and forth is as horrible. So, um, so we it, um, the countries I think need to do more to in Latin America to make the economics balance out better, so that it's not so um, so enticing or necessary to leave your families and break up families and come here to the U.S. because this is where they have opportunity and hope for education, like. Um, you know, it eats. It, tell me your name. <laughs> Itzia. Um, Itzia, thank you. I'm so sorry. Itzia, you know, I'm sure that, that you probably didn't have educational opportunity, which is a big reason that, that you would come. And, and, you know, our schools do provide that. So, uh, I. So, Phyllis, if you were invited by. Um, Biden administration and um, other members of Congress to a roundtable on uh, what would be uh, a priority in terms of a um, um, re uh, a transformation of immigration for the United States. What's what would be something you would share? I would. Um... From my perspective, for the people in and in, in we see in the community where I am, is to give visas to people to come to the um, states and work and to be able to go back and forth. Um, so when there's work here, they could work, and when there's not work here, they could go back home, and they don't have they they are able to travel back and forth to see their families. They don't have to completely be cut off from their families, and um, and then if they have if if that um, then helps the economics in their own country, if they can set up small businesses with saving some money, they can um, provide more opportunities for their children in schools there because they do have good schools in El Salvador, um, but not in the small villages and stuff. And you you know you need to have a, a good economic base to be able to send your children to a good school. So, um, you know, it's just a lot of disparity, like in all of Latin America, they have the really rich and then the real and the really poor. So if we could get a middle ground and get more of a um, establish a, a middle class economically, 
I think that would help. But so, so I'm, so I'm advocating for visas and a lot of people just like, like I was an adventurous person. I wanted to travel and see, and see the world. So if I, if I was able to have a visa and could go and travel, I would go home. Um, every time I did travel, I was anxious to go home. And so, um, yeah, so people could travel and, and move freely, then um, I think it would help a lot. So it's it's um, not like everybody, we have this mentality in the States that, oh, they just want to take things from us and, you know, we're just like need to hang on to what we have and not let, you know, those people, whoever those people are, take from us. And um, But if we had a more open policy, I don't think we, maybe we could get over that mentality. I'm not sure. <laughs> That would be my hope. It's our hope too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Marcia and Itzia, any final, any thoughts? I just want to say thank you for your fearlessness. And it continues to show and shine. And um, even today in this conversation, I have learned more, which is life changing for me. So thank you. You. This is like my, my first experience. I've been very ner very nervous about a podcast. And so thank you for um welcoming me and making me feel comfortable and and joining you. Well, you're a natural. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I wanted to say thank you for sharing and how sharing your experiences and how far and how much you've helped the community. Um, I really, um, like you said, like giving, you know, our visas, cause that is something that for me, I came to the U S when I was four years old and my brother was four months old. And so we, all we've known is here. And I know my parents, it's been almost 20 years and they have barely had the opportunity to, my dad is one of 12, so he's barely had the opportunity to see his um, siblings because they received visas to come to the U.S. and visit. And to me, I'm more than anything, I'd love to go back to my land and see my people and experience. And it's something that I have felt so disconnected from. Mm -hmm. And I think with our podcast uh, last week, it really emphasizes, you know, the strength that you get from your ancestors, from your roots. And so I think a lot of times when um, there are our immigrant community, they kind of feel that disconnection and that isolation and that loneliness. And it's such a big thing that affects mental health. And it kind of cascades into, you know, even the economics and politics and everything else. But yeah, no, I definitely agree. It's, it's that need, that kind of connection to our cultures. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully you can you can go home to <laughs> Mexico, even though home is the United States. But to go home and connect soon, I, the yeah. best the best to you. I I do feel for you very deeply. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Are there any concluding words you'd like to share? It's been an honor and a privilege to hear your story and to hear about your wonderful work. No, oh, thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. That's that's it. <laughs> okay, well, we are so honored to have had you, our treasured listeners, join us today on Abuelas. We thank you, Phyllis, for taking the time to be with us. And we thank Familias en Acción in Portland, Oregon, for your commitment to Abuelas and the amazing support they provide to us. Please join us again here on Abuelas en Acción. Gracias. Gracias.